In this video, we're going to discuss gene pools and speciation, and this is for IB section 10.3. To start out, a gene pool is a combination of all the genes and their different allele possibilities within a specific population of a single species. So if you can imagine a, a population, all of the different genes that those species have and all of their specific alleles, remember an allele is a specific type or form of the gene or the trait, the gene pool is all of those alleles within the population. And so the allele frequency then is the frequency at, at, w at which each of the different types of alleles are present within a gene pool. In order for evolution to occur, as we've talked about, there has to be a change in the allele frequency w uh, within the population. And this is, again, driven by different selective pressures or environmental changes, and it occurs by natural selection. In looking at this overall question of speciation gene pools, the question arises, what is a species? What makes species unique or different from one another? Obviously, all of these individuals in the pictures here are very different. The dog and the wolf probably a little bit more similar than some of the other ones. But what is it that makes a species? If we look at dogs more specifically, dogs are actually all members of the same species. What makes them different is what we refer to as their breeds. And so they're all different breeds. Technically, dogs could all interbreed with one another. Dogs of different breeds could breed with one another and reproduce with one another and produce a living organism that could be able to reproduce. But that doesn't really help us to answer our overall question of what is a species. And a species, if we want to give it a definition, is a group of organisms of common ancestry that closely resemble each other, structurally and biochemically in terms of their DNA, and are members of the natural population that and this is the key part, that do or have the ability to, put, to breed, to reproduce, and have one or more fertile offspring. That's probably the most important part, is a species, what makes a species unique is members of the same group or population that are able to breed or reproduce and have reproducing offspring. And so here's another way of saying that as well. Um, member of the, of the same group that can breed and have reproducing offsprings. And speciation is the process of forming a new species by splitting of an existing species. And what we're going to do in this video is look at some of the different ways that this can actually happen. And the first thing that we want to take a look at is barriers or things that separate gene pools. So we're going back to gene pools here. And the first one that we're looking at is something called geographic isolation. This is probably one of the more common and easily stood under uh, examples of barriers between gene pools. If we have a population and there's something, some event or some sort of structural thing, uh, some geographic thing that separates this, the, the population from each other, in this case maybe a river or a large river. And so these two different populations are separated and if those two different environments are, are different from one, eno one another enough, um, this could eventually lead to different species, and this is a form of geographic isolation. And a great example of this is seen in some different salamander species in California. Um, this ancestral population of salamanders migrated down the coast and the eastern portion of California, and basically went on either side of the mountain range, Sierra Nevada mountain range here. Salamanders that are on the coast developed, because of the environment, a very bright orange color that, that uh, was a mimicry of some poisonous newts. And so they were mimicking these poisonous newts and basically copying the more poisonous signal um, from their color, even though they weren't poisonous. The salamanders on the eastern part of the mountain range developed a sort of camouflage to help them blend in. And so because of this geographic isolation. Because they're geographically isolated, they, these two different groups have changed due to the different environments that they were found in. A second type of barrier is called a hybrid infertility. And this is, a, this is an example that we can, that we can see in uh, ligers or mules. Uh, a hybrid is a cross between two different species. Uh, that is a living organism but is not able to produce. So for example, a liger is a cross between a uh, male lion and a female tiger. It produces a very large cat. They're actually the largest cats on the planet. And they are not able to reproduce. Just the same as the cross between a horse and a donkey, a mule is not able to reproduce. Both of these are living organisms, but, they're, but even though they can produce a living offspring, they're not able to, to be able to reproduce. Uh, 
A third type is called temporal isolation. And we see this oftentimes in mating patterns or in plants in the release of pollen. This is all based off time. Temporal refers to time. And so if we look at, uh, for example, in this diagram, we have three different species here. And these different species are uh, reproducing at different time periods of the year. And so they are separated. They're not able to reproduce because they are separated by when they actually do reproduce. And that's based off of different times. Um, pollen, for example, if you have different species of plants that are releasing their pollen at different times of the year, different parts of the spring, they're not going to crossbreed with one another, so they become isolated. The fourth and final type of isolation is something called behavioral isolation, and this is seen in different types of behaviors. And uh, in our picture here, we've got two different um, types of birds, uh, blue. Um, footed boobies, and these two different types of birds have slightly different behavioral um, actions and, and things that they do in order to reproduce. Um, one group has kind of a courting dance, and another has a pointing display with their feathers and their, and their wings. And so based off the behaviors, these two groups are isolated from one another. All of these, whether it's temporal, behavioral, or geographic, or even hybrid, lead to something called reproductive isolation. If there's behavioral isolation, or temporal isolation, or geographic isolation, it interferes with the ability of those groups to be able to reproduce. And that is reproductive isolation. They are reproductively isolated from one another. So this image helps to illustrate that. If we have a population of fruit flies, and they are geographically isolated from one another, they're isolated for a long enough period of time, over time, just like in those salamanders, they're going to develop enough differences in their DNA through different selective pressures in those environments. And if enough time goes along, then those two populations will be separated and change to the point where they're, if they were to reconvene or, or reunite, they're not able to reproduce because so many different changes have developed uh, in terms of their genetics and uh, behaviors, their, their things that they do in order to be able to reproduce, or, or structurally, it could be a structural difference as well. So all of these things can result in change within a population. And there's two different ideas of how, uh, how long or the amount of time it takes for this change to occur. Charles Darwin suggested the idea of gradualism, his idea of natural selection. He suggested that it would take a very long and gradual amount of time in order for change to occur within populations. More recently, a second scientist suggested the idea of punctuated equilibrium, or periods of very fast change. And Stephen Jay Gould is the scientist who suggested this. And he basically suggested there were periods of no change followed by very quick bursts of large amount of change. Um, and so the, the, basically there would be nothing, no change, and then there would be some sort of punctuated event that would change or disrupt the equilibrium or the balance. Um, and so in terms of geological time, it still would maybe take generations and possibly hundreds or thousands of years. But in terms of geographic time, that would be very quickly, would occur very quickly in terms of overall geographic time. And the fossil record does support this uh, in terms of different um, pieces of evidence that we found in the fossil record supports that we've seen both gradualism and punctuated equilibrium occurring in nature. Here's another way to be able to, to look at this. Um, in which punctuated equilibrium, we're going to see long periods of no change and then very rapid, sudden bursts of change. And this could be caused by a variety of different events, whereas a gradualism is going to be a more gradual change to different uh, variations and potentially even different species. So to kind of recap, gradualism, slow change from one form to another, punctuated equilibrium, long periods of time without any change, followed by short periods of rapid evolution. One of the last things that we want to talk about in this video is polyploidy and speciation, the process of, of making some different species. And polyploidy is uh, an organism with more than two sets of chromosomes. It usually occurs most often in plants, some asexually re reproducing animals. Strawberries are a good example of this. They are actually octoploid, meaning they have eight copies of their DNA. And it can result from hybridization between different species or when chromosomes duplicate in preparation for meiosis, and this is the, probably the most common. Um, but when those chromosomes don't separate, it creates a diploid gamete. And if that happens enough, you can actually get more and more copies of, of the chromosomes. Um, strawberries, potatoes, uh, dahlias, those are examples of, of plants that represent polyploidy. Um, uh, there is a rodent from Argentina 
that has actually extra chromosomes is, is polyploidy. Um, and so it's, it's not very common in, in, in mammals, but it can occur occasionally. And so what it is, again, is an additional set of chromosomes um, can come from those errors in meiosis, creating diploid gametes, which then when they fuse with other gametes, produce uh, extra or more chromosomes. So to finish up our examination of polyploidy, we want to look at a uh, genus that contains onions, leeks, garlics, uh, chives. Um, determining the number of species is oftentimes difficult uh, due to numerous polyploidy events within a genus. And so this can create large numbers of reproductively isolated but otherwise similar populations. Um, and it occurs due to asexual reproduction and polyploidy sometimes gives an advantage over diploids uh, under some different selective pressures. And so this genus that, that contains onions, leeks, garlic, and chives um, was originally thought to be a much larger genus in terms of the number of species. But when examining, um, when DNA evidence was available to be able to examine um, the different species, it found that it actually was, was, many of these species were incorrectly labeled. To examine how uh, species can actually change, we're going to look at three different types of selection um, to finish up this video. The first is directional selection, and this is a situation in which one extreme form of the trait is favored over others. And this produces an allele frequency shift in the direction of the favored phenotype. So if we look at our graph here, our image here, the dotted line is representing a bell curve of the original population where right about here would represent the average form of whatever this trait is and then we obviously have individuals that are above this average and below this average whereas the y-axis is going to indicate number of individuals. Due to some sort of environmental selective pressure uh, one form of that trait is better in this case the ex uh, high extreme of that form of trait is the better and so over time we see the population shift, shift so that we have a higher number of individuals at the at this higher average. Um, an example of this would be uh, the Galapagos finches uh, in terms of their beak sizes changing from one form to another, as well as uh, migration timing when sockeye salmon would, um, w when they would actually migrate in, in, for, uh, to begin their, their migration in order to be able to spawn and reproduce. The second type of selection is disruptive selection, and this is a situation in which both extreme forms of a phenotype are favored over the intermediate, and this is a shift um, in the direction away from the uh, extreme form of the trait. And so this is a graph here that represents disruptive selection, where originally we would have a high number of individuals in the middle here, and in this case, due to disruptive selection, we have more individuals with the, both extreme forms of, of the trait. One of the main driving forces for this is sympatric speciation, which creates different niches for the population and, over, and, and essentially decreases the amount of competition. And a, a real life example of this would be uh, rabbits with different fur colors. If you've got light, gray, and maybe black or dark rabbits, the gray being the least fit in the population, so you see more that are um, light or, or black or dark. The last form of selection is called stabilizing selection, and this is um, when the average or one form of the phenotype is, is favored over the, over the other. Uh, the middle form is, is best fit for the environment, and this actually helps to stabilize the population on a particular trait value, and it's kind of the opposite of dis disruptive selection. And a great example of this is seen in uh, human birth weight. Uh, obviously babies that are too small have, have a decreased chance of survival, babies that are too large it's physically more difficult to deliver them, uh, especially before uh, C-sections. And so we, we have seen uh, more babies being born at uh, this average form of the trait, a, a, a specific window uh, of birth size. We can also see this in um, the laying the number of eggs. If birds lay too few eggs, then they have less chance of being able to survive. Too many eggs, they can't be able to provide food for all of these chicks. So it's a very specific number. Um, due to stabilizing selection of chick eggs that are produced. That's our discussion of gene pools and speciation. We'll finish up this unit uh, by looking at uh, cladograms and cladistics.